which used the external store of weight, CG location, and moment of inertia, and they would clear it to a, like a very large number uh, of knots and over the Mach, uh, range of Mach numbers. The problem we ran into is that if you, if you look at this twin store carrier, this green part, without the stores, it turned the airplane into a biplane, okay? And in fact, when, if you were flying with a single one of these, say um, on, on the, uh, say it's on the left wing, and you went to pull G, okay? You'd have to actually have to put trim to hold that wing down as if there was a thousand pound store on the other wing. That's how much force it generated. So this would not be something that would be covered by that parametric flutter clearance. You know, and the problem is like, you do want to get an operational use, operationally uh, usable flight envelope, but it's also, also got to be safe, right? So, so what I did is I imagined a plane, in, in uh, a plane cut, you know, along the along the, uh, you know, vertically, lined up with the uh, pylon, and I did a two degree free of, a degree of freedom analysis. Because I knew I knew what the modes of motion were for the different frequencies, and I knew where the where the center of pressure would be roughly and the lobe geometry. So I did a two degree of freedom analysis, showing the work done per cycle per oscillation of the wing, and if that ever got to be positive, it would diverge, right? Potentially. So well, luckily, because of the way the the three degrees nose down and stuff like this, actually it always was damping. So that's how we actually got a flutter clearance for this thing, right? The, uh, the other problem, I mean, this is where conferences and things come in and publications. Uh, you're worried about the, the, the carriage loads. And in particular, there, there's, uh, well, the, there's an a explosive bolt that attaches the pylon to the wing because the pylon is actually denisable, okay? And there's sway braces. This is what a sway brace looks like that handles the, the, the lateral torques, okay? And what we needed to determine was how those loads varied with an airspeed Mach number and angle of attack, right? And Because we, we could put pressure gauges under the sway braces measure measure a bit of force, but it's a redundant structure, so you couldn't actually resolve it completely. So, Basically, what I discovered was there had been there were wind tunnel tests going on at the time, and it appeared from other people's work that the the forces on the pylon, lateral forces on a pylon, scale to the product of angle of attack and dynamic pressure. Okay, and uh, so what we did is we invented a maneuver called a wind up turn. And you would, we would start out at high altitude where the dynamic pressure is low and we had a target Mach number, Mach point to 85 or nine or whatever it was, depending on the store. And so we would start at, uh, at, at what was the corner velocity, you know, which or, or your max, max G, well, within the angle of attack limits and everything like this. So say if it's a five G turn, you hit, you, you start at the design point to do an abrupt roll, and then you you <clears throat> sustain the G as you're as you're slowing down, basically getting to well, ten degrees angle of attack was where the airplane pitched up. You didn't want to go there, so basically you follow it through and you sweep through angle of attack and dynamic pressure, and then you would do these maneuvers at lower and lower altitude until you hit five twenty point eight five, for example, which was one of the limits for uh, for takeoff flap. But that was all done based on parametric. The other thing I learned about was points in the sky. Uh, like if you think of all the possible airspeed, altitude, Mach number, configuration, fuel state, you know, I mean, you'd spend the entire life of an airplane testing every point. So you need some analysis to identify what are the critical design conditions. You know, generally the structures guys are quick to tell you what those are. My job is to find out where that was in the flight envelope. And using these kind of parametric analyses, what's the safest way to get there without killing somebody or breaking an airplane, right? 
The nice thing about it, I guess, was that for a lot of the testing, the most critical aircraft, both the F-5 and the 104, was a two-seater. Since I'm the one doing these parametric analyses and hand-wavy things, uh, I was the guy in the back seat. So I, I guess I was the, uh, <laughs> the pilots didn't seem too worried as long as Conrad bet his life on the, on the results. And yeah. apparently I was right. So, you know, but, but it, is a, it was a really a interesting way to learn about points in the sky, right? And analysis to actually find, you know, the route to get to these things in a safe way, right? And we learned about build up flight test program, wind up turns. Uh, one of the, because we couldn't inspect the aft fuselage, <clears throat> one of the maneuvers we did was an abrupt rolling pull up. You always do it to the right because the pilot's quicker that way, right? So, say if you're doing a 5G abrupt rolling pull out, 520.85 with a maneuver flap out. So he's in full afterburner with a configuration like this. And then, you know, as he hits the test point, wham, you know, kind of thing. If you ever, if you go to the Air Museum, there's a 104 there, the one that was used for the uh, altitude record, the Bud White flu. If you take a look behind the wing, behind the, on the lower fuselage, you'll see 45 degree angle wrinkles. They're there from, right from manufacture. It's because of the torque on, on the, on the, uh, generated by the T-tail uh, configuration. So the only way we could, we could test this, and I remember doing this uh, one sequence. I was in a chase airplane this time, and we were gradually building up the increasing G, you know, increasing forces on the tail. And basically, I take a look at the fuselage, you know, and you can actually see the wrinkle. Okay, don't get any worse yet. Bang! Well, it's still looking good. And we get to within what we thought was a limit. And then we, we'd uh, land, and the technicians would bring out rulers and physically measure the wrinkles to make sure they didn't grow. Now, you think about it. Yield is supposed to, you know, 115% 100, of design limits supposedly yield. That's permanent set. Well, all the aircraft had a permanent set right there. You just didn't want to make it worse, right? You know, Bob rivets and stuff. It was it was pretty pretty wild way to do things, but that was how I got introduced to to uh, I guess it's called pragmatic engineering, right? Because if you didn't if you didn't get creative, actually, I guess nowadays the buzzword is innovative. We'd be stalled. You would never get that clearance. You would never certify that. You know, type thing. The uh, one of the other interesting projects we had, um, again, this was part of that clearance, was the certification of the CRV-7 rocket uh, firing on the on the 104. Now, in the in the certification program, we did things like handling qualities and stuff like this. Uh, we invented something called a tracking task, which, by the way, is still used. It was used on the development of those. Um, the F-35, they would, they would, they would do uh, controlled uh, tracking of, a, of, a, of, an, of, a, of say, an F-16 and doing a 9G turn, and they would, they would basically use the results of the, of the, you know, the PIPR and whatnot to optimize the, the flight controls, because it was basically a software-defined aircraft, right, to actually optimize it so it's operational useful, right? So anyway, uh, the, on this aircraft, the only testing we'd done, we'd, we'd done handling qualities, we'd done safe firing, okay? And you have things like there's a nose cone, does that actually scuff the wing? Well, it didn't, you know? Um, there's also a, a, a head-end igniter, which actually went zipping by, but with a T-tail, that didn't do anything, any damage, you know? But also you do a safe jettison of a full or empty pod, okay? And firing. And the firing was done generally at Mach 0.7. So you're looking at, at, at different dive angles and things like this, right? Well, the CRV-7 replaced the, what's called the Mark IV rocket. Mark IV rocket was certified to Mach 1.5 and it was fin stabilized. So at the end, when the, when the rocket came out, these fins deployed and away it went. Uh, basically DREV, what they did is they developed a, a better propellant, but also if they found that they use wraparound fins and a spiral in the nozzle, they could actually use, develop a spin stabilized rocket, which had a much higher impulse. So 
because myself and and the, the pilot and the and the structural engineer I was working with, we we basically were the ones that put together the modified uh, uh, flight envelope. A draft of it came down to eighty, and there was a USAF exchange officer basically just pencil whipped the thing to CRV seven to Mach one point four. I'm a physicist, right? I'm thinking, well, bad idea. Something could happen. I mean, you got a spin stabilized rocket, they're transonic, and we're firing them in pairs, by the way, because when you're doing, you know, going at 550 knots, uh, and there's a convoy you're trying to, you know, <clears throat> develop attitude with, you don't want one rocket in the front and the rest of them passed, you know, so you have to get them up very quickly. And there's like minimum intervalometer settings. And it took a bit of a bit of persuasion to finally get a load of CRV sevens to demonstrate, you know, transonic effects. One load. <laughs> and so, so what I did, the uh, I said, oh, why don't we try Mach 0.95? Because a lot of really interesting stuff happens <laughs> under the wing of 0.95. And in, and and at Cold Lake, there's a there's a, a place called Pelican Island. It's actually a game preserve for pelicans. Like, who would have known that? You know, I thought they were like tropical, but it was a game preserve for pelicans, right? So what I did, I gave the pilot a bogus setting to make sure he didn't hit a pelican, you know, but in his, in his gun sight in the film, you can imagine the, the, the commanders look at me because he saw the pipper on the island. He said, well, no, I knew he could never hit it. That came out wrong, by the way, you know? Anyway, what happened was when he fired it, there were pigtails all over the place. The guy's voice is going up. He's flying through a smoke trail, and these clouds went all over the place, these, these rockets. And it turns out what was happening when they came out with pairs, they're spitting up, and the shock interactions between them was enough to start them corkscrewing. They were just spiraling all over the sky. And uh, it was a, you know, when you have an I told you so moment, don't press too hard, right? Because sometimes you're just lucky, right? I wasn't quite sure what had happened, but I knew you, you know, but it was an I told you so moment. Right? So the only solution at the time was to actually go to single salvo. You know, in other words, you couldn't fire them in pairs. And if you had adjacent pods, it turns out the variability and the timing was such that they never actually interacted. And on the F-18, we have a verb and that, Basically, the the knowledge used to clear the CRV seven on on the on the F eighteen was based on those results. So the net, the big message there was, you really got to be aware of extrapolation. I mean, it seemed obvious. Eh, you know, this is an upgrade. We're replacing a, a rocket clear to Mach one point four. What could go wrong, right? Well, <laughs> luckily we found out. You know, just one quick question. Sure. What was was there any interaction between the Mach number and the instability of the rockets, or was it really the interval which was the critical parameter? Well, I picked Mach 0.95 because I knew there were strong shocks forming around okay. that area. Okay. And and one would get out just enough ahead okay. that it would start doing this. Got it. Okay. Yeah, that was that's why 95, because we had to stay six on it. Okay. Uh, the next next uh Little story. Uh, I was involved in the the first uh, clearance of Canadian unique weapons on the F five, and the F five uh, has has a much more flexible wing. So aeroelastic stability was a big deal, and we actually uh, the the NLR, which was a laboratory in the Netherlands, developed a very good flutter model for the F five, and and. Canada Air, now Bombardier, basically were paid to take that model and, and host it and apply it for these clearance of Canadian weapons like the CRV-7. And uh, the thing with aeroelastic stability is um, there can be surprises because most models are, are fairly linear and, and your trap is nonlinearity. And what happens in a, in a flutter program, in this case, it was a single seat aircraft, okay, so as a pilot up, you know, driving around, I, I'm I'm the test controller. So I'm on a, on a on a radio, and we have to maintain constant communication. Okay. Next to me is a is a uh, head recorder recording raw data from accelerometers. For example, on the tip tank of the F5. Okay. I keep pointing to the screen; you can't see it, but like right in the nose there. 
would be an accelerometer and they were distributed throughout because we needed to find out uh, what modes were. Mm -hmm. So the only real time data you had were strip charts and over further to the right was a fast Fourier analyzer. So the way a test point was conducted, you, st you started up at, at high altitude, you know, going through the range of Mach numbers you want to clear, but at low dynamic pressure, okay? And increments of so many knots, okay? And the danger, the, the dangerous part of the test is the acceleration of the next test point. Once you're there, they use a lateral stick wrap to excite the anti-symmetric road uh, modes, a longitudinal stick wrap to, to excite the longitudinal modes, this one, <laughs> okay. And, uh, and basically the fast Fourier analyzer, you would get a very precise reading of the peaks, you see. And, and, uh, and generally, in general, it's like bending and torsion, what you're worried about the lowest frequency modes. And as you increase Mach number and, and Q, these things would approach. And if they ever joined, you had divergent flutter, you see. So as you're going to the next point, we think it's okay, but you don't know, right? So anyway, uh, it was a Saturday morning because you got to go when you got the weather, right? You know, and I'm on the, on the mic and, and he's, he's the guy from Candair and the Dutchman there watching the strip chart. And we have to include an overfly. We were clearing the configuration of Mach 0.85 and we were out going towards Mach 0.86, 0.865. And all of a sudden, now the, the tip tank accelerometers had a, a, a peak range of plus or minus two and a half G. All of a sudden, whoop, things took off. The pilot's voice went up, okay? There was a buzz between the two engineers and I'm looking at it. It went up and it stabilized it at uh, plus or minus two G and then it would get a, a gust two and a half, whatever. And all I said was LCO keep going. And, and bless his socks, he did. And poof, it disappeared. It was a five knot speed band. But I had four eyeballs looking at me saying, what the heck happened? And I said, well, you know, if you look at, at an F5, uh, this part of the fuselage is highly Coke bottle, okay? So you get a, a strong shock forming very early at that stage, and it was interacting with the boundary layer at the root of the wing. So that, so that is not something included in the analytical model, right? So what we saw was an LCO where it was driven to a certain amplitude. It was fundamentally a damp mode. It's just that there was a driving force going on. And once you're through that little window, you're good. See, and we could clear it to Mach 0.85 because outside the envelope, right? So the real message in this is that whatever models you're looking at, there are known, uh, known unknowns and unknown unknown assumptions buried in there. They are never reality. You know, there are always some assumptions. See, and that was an example of showing me, basically, in a, in a case that is actually very critical for an aircraft. Um, an example of one of because we had a really sophisticated model from the day. The other thing that happens in stability and control is uh, because of the flexibility of the wing, there would be stick force lightning. And I think if I seem to recall at the time, uh, stick force per G had to be above, uh, I think it was three plus three. And uh, boy, we had some rough rides there where, you know, you, you could actually, and you can't have stick force reversals because that means the guy's trying to do this while he's trying to fly the airplane. And this was another another time when uh, to make sure that the uh, the, the reduction in stability uh, wasn't too severe, we went back to these tracking tests. You know, hold the pipper on the on the aircraft you're following, and then we do the statistics of the pipper on the target and see how much it's how much the dispersion grew. It was a measure of how much work the pilot was doing to hold it in place. Right. One of my most memorable things in this. Uh, alludes to facing death, I guess. <laughs> I call it, there's a little lesson, say, listen to that still small voice, okay? Really benign test program, right? You see these, these are called electro electroluminescent panels for night formation lights. So there's that one, and then there's one around here, and there's one at the front. Okay, there you go, see? And one up there. So if you're flying at night in enemy territory, you got all your lights out, you know, and all this, you can actually see this gentle light and you can actually hold position, right? Well, we had to do a flight test to, uh, you know, 
make sure they don't blow off, right? Simple enough. So we put together a, a two flight test program and we used the dual. The first test flight uh, uh, test point, I was going for 710 knots, uh, Mach 1.72, bang. That was max dynamic pressure, uh, you know, max Q. And the, uh, the idea was to do a, a six and a half, or actually 7.3 G pole, check to four and a half G, and a, and a 360 roll. So you can do everything in one maneuver. The reason you need to do it all in one maneuver is you're pretty much out of gas because it takes that much fuel to get up there to do it, right? So uh, I briefed the, uh, the pilot and there's lag in the, in the airspeed indicators and it's really bad form if you ever blow through the limits you're going after, right? Very aware of that being a junior captain, you know? So anyway, uh, I calculated the lag and, and the key to getting to Mach 1.72 was to actually, when you're you know, accelerating up, we were at 35,000 feet actually, to go to zero G, put the nose up, go to zero G, go super, and just let the nose gently fall down, right? And you can actually build up to 1.72, 710. <laughs> pilot put the nose down. So of course, as an engineer, you are free to give advice to the pilot. I'm just ripping a strip off them because all my numbers are wrong. I don't know the thing. No idea, because we'd never been there before. And he says, I'm sorry, just, just tell me when to pull up. <laughs> so, so, so it's 690. Okay, now. Now remember, I'm the instrumentation system, right? Bang, 7.33 G, four and a half, wow, you know. And it turned out that as soon as you put the G on, the airspeed stops dead. <laughs> well, 7 G, right, you know. And uh, it was funny, because later, the uh, the pilot who flew it came back to me later and said on one of his old training missions, he actually did follow the profile and work. So again, I know, right? But no, but not you don't push that thing too much, you know. Anyway, the second test flight, I was worried about flexibility of the V stab and all this stuff, right? And the and the uh, Canadian F5 had a hydraulic pressure limiter, so we actually had more rudder authority than the other F5. The other F5s had a hard stop, right? Plus or minus 10 degrees or whatever it was. We could actually get more rudder. And the whole idea behind that is think of top gun, you know, using a rudder, you know, because guns don't maneuver, the airplane does, right? So you're trying to do the kill, right? And they did a five degree of freedom analysis. Remember that wall? There was a binder just down here, which was the document of the five degree of freedom analysis. Now, I remember looking at it. I knew what the most critical point was. It was actually 1G at uh, Mach 0.95, you know, at fairly low altitude, you know, 5,000 feet above ground, but a 1G entry. And uh, they tested a benign condition. And it was really interesting. You read the thing, the, the, this validated the model. And basically what they did is they basically certified the aircraft to do abrupt full rudder and full aileron rolls, right? And because that, that was allowed in the aircraft operating instructions, I had that in my test card as a final demo of this, where you actually see, and you can actually, our chase aircraft actually saw the V-stab bending in flight. It freaked them out, freaked me out listening to that, right? You know? So anyway, uh, so I had a test card all approved and it was like three o'clock in the afternoon. We were first launched the next morning. You know, you get that little voice, like this good owl, bad owl, right? Well, this this was mother owl saying, <laughs> why don't you go look at that report again? Hmm. So I pulled the report out and I looked at the critical condition. What would have happened, what they predicted was a 1G entry, Mach 0.95 abrupt full rudder with the full aileron. You would go to plus six and a half G rolling, which is actually exceeds the aircraft limit. The real problem was you'd hit minus six and a half G a second later, which means the wings come off. They're, they're you know, without any roll. And this is like even worse. I mean, but this basically minus three G was the limit on the aircraft. So basically we had a test point where it would have been pretty entertaining for the chase pilot, but not a lot of fun for us because the wings would have come off. You can't eject because the airplane's rolling too fast and uh, I wouldn't have been here, right? <laughs> so so luckily, I listened to that voice, you know, made a few phone calls. This is like late in the day. So there's the commander, the senior test pilot, senior test engineer, my test pilot, you know, 
And I showed him those. And I showed him the prediction. Wow. So what do, you, what do you recommend? See, that's a nice thing, being the flight dynamicist. Well, I figure you can do like full aileron, half rudder, or full rudder, half aileron, but don't ever do them both together. So they had a conversation about what would be most usable, useful for the pilot. Well, full rudder with a little bit of aileron. Nobody in their right mind would do this, right? You know, they were allowed to, right? So I wrote my one and only ops immediate message at four o'clock that day, sent out under Commander AT signature, advising all F5 operators that, they, that the, there was a limit of, if you're gonna do a, a full rudder with aileron, you're limited to half aileron. And of course we have to demonstrate the worst case, right? So, so anyway, it's a two seater because that's actually more critical and there's a chase pilot. I'm walking out there. I don't have a G suit, right? I'm just an engineer. The pilot, the chase pilot had a G suit. I'm thinking, there's something here, right? You know, it's good. <laughs> so strap in. And we do some practices. Uh, in, in a normally one would have a thing called a stick stopper, which is basically something designed and you could calibrate it like this, but we didn't have the time and didn't have one. The stick stopper was my left knee, right? So we did some calibrating rolls with my left knee braced against the size of the cockpit, <laughs> bang, you know? And, and every time we did one of these practices, boom, my head would hit the canopy. So after a few of the, and, and, and by the way, the guy talking in the, oh, you should see the wings and the tail bend. <laughs> Shut up, you know, kind of thing. Tell me that later. Bang, bang. So finally we we're going to do the real thing and I just had enough, right? So I had my elbows up on the canopy room, I'm holding my head because, I had enough of this, right? <laughs> and I'm the instrumentation system. I got to remember the G, you know, like the, everything that's going on, right? So, so hit mock one, hit the number, like, no, right? And what happened was, like, I'd never actually blacked out before. I kind of grayed out once, but my, and you get there's a thing called tunnel vision, you know, and literally, and my first react, oh darn, I'm not going to be able to see the instruments. I failed, you know. So it went like this, bang, it went open. It was black and white, just like an old black and white TV, but it was slow motion. The weirdest thing I'd ever seen, the dials were doing this. You know, it's like, like a movie in slow motion. I'm watching the dials. Oh, we hit that. Oh, we hit that. It's still happening in like a second or two, right? You know? And he levels out. And you probably guess I chatter in the thing. Well, the problem when he leveled out, I was a little disoriented, right? I wanted to stand up. And I knew that was a bad idea when you're in a you know, an aircraft going Mach 0.95, and there's ejection handles to the side. You don't want to touch those, right? So I just sat there and grabbed my knees, right? And uh, meanwhile, the chase by just jabbering away. You shouldn't see what happened, right? I don't think so. So we're going along Mach 0.95, you know, covering a lot of ground, right? Pilot says, you okay back there? And uh, I didn't, it's just a lot of work. You have a physiological incident. I don't want to do that. So I, I knew I'd get better, I said. <clears throat> just hold a sucker steady while I write it off, you know, just to, you know, fool him into thinking I was okay. Well, eventually I was. Well, it was years later, actually talking to the principal at Carlton. I always freaked me out. How come time slowed down? And it turns out that we, we, we have a sample rate of about 50 times a second where the image is updated, Okay. It's like Bayesian statistics and all this stuff, but we hold it. We hold an image, and fifty times a second, it gets refreshed, right? Apparently, there's ten percent people who, under situations like I was in, their their refresh rate speeds up. Now, I sacrifice color, and I don't know if there was sound. I, I wasn't really too focused on that, but basically. I was running. I was running a frame rate two or three times normal, so it seemed like time slowed down. Right? There's another ten percent that just freeze. They usually die, you know, kind of thing. But in most people, they just party on, right? You know. So it was actually years later that I finally found out what happened. It's like, whoa, the time space continuum, you know, nothing like that. So anyway, uh, the big lesson here is you do have. There's a still small voice. You've ever listened to it. And things have to make sense, you know? I mean, that was the, the other reason I, I, I could do a lot of the, uh, you know, I would get no arguments from the test pilot because they would just look at the other limits and say, yeah, this makes sense. You know what I mean? They would not know the complexity of what it took to get there. Oh, I'll yeah. ask a quick question regarding the limits. So those are like 
uh, displaced limits, but they were not rate limits in any way. Like you, the rate could be basically as fast as the pilot could. Oh, you mean put in? Yeah. That's why we always had to do the worst case, full abrupt control. Okay. That's why it went to the right, you know, stomp, you know. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. yeah that's... Now, the thing, the link with CASI, my first experience with CASI was making going to conferences and giving presentations, me and my, my contemporaries at the flight test group back in the seventies. So that's where I first learned about CASI and you know, journals and other, other, other conferences. Now, after, after that, I was on the F-18 acquisition project uh, that was mentioned in my bio. This is an interesting example of what I refer to as addressing the cause, not the effect, right? You see, See this, these, uh, this vortex coming off the leading edge extension, that, that little cloud there, okay? Um, before this little fence was put on there, there was an interaction between that vortex and the vertical stabilizer, which was causing cracking in the V-step. It would resonate, and it was certain combination of speed and angle of attack, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and the answer seemed to be, well, we'll just put more material you see these cleats here, these little brackets? That was added, and then they realize all that does is transfer the vibration deeper into the structure. So what, what uh, McDonnell Douglas did is they did a wind tunnel test program. It was then tested close to 90 different configurations of some way to deflect and anchor the vortex so it wouldn't interact with the V-step. The answer was this little fence about a foot long, picks up above this bay. And, and you can see how, see the vortex burst here? Mission accomplished. Now there's still a bit of buffet, but not, it's not a, a, a serious concern. So that would, to me was a beautiful example of, of wherever possible, it's more elegant to address the cause rather than the effect, particularly when it comes to structural problems, right? Uh, the, the uh, first Gulf War, uh, by then I'd become a full colonel. Oh, by the way, I'd been in the chief of research and development. I kept getting losing my job as I was getting promoted, right? So now I was a full colonel. My first Friday in the job, I get a call from the commander of Maritime Air Group. He says, uh, Shearwater's on 24-7. We're going to the Gulf in 10 days. Oh, so I laughed, right? Because I knew him, right? He says, so what's so funny? I said, well, you want to get a rise out of me on my first Friday in the job. You got to do better than that. He goes, no, I'm serious. Oh, well, I'll get right on it, right? <laughs> like who would have known, right? That was just out of the blue. And of course, our, our, our sea kings were basically configured for anti-submarine warfare. Now these guys, this time we're looking at, uh, you know, potentially shooting, like with a machine gun. We needed a flare. We didn't have one and all this stuff. So I went over to see the, uh, the head operator, my counterpart. And I took one of my trusty lieutenant colonels with me. And I said, where are you going? Okay, yeah, got it. What's the threat? Because I need to understand the threat scenario they have to face. What do you want? <laughs> it was fun. So anyway, uh, and, and my buddies, my wingman's taking notes, right? Well, we're going to need a flare, you know, because they need to be able to intercept and identify shipping. Okay. That'll be the FLIR 2000. And the reason I knew that was that in my previous incarnation at AT, we had flight tested a FLIR 2000 on a helicopter, and I could name the people who could make that happen quickly. So that's this, that's that, okay? We went on, okay, we need a chaff flare dispenser. Well, that'll be the LE-40, because we use them on the Hercs. We can get some from there. Uh, we need an IR jammer. That's this guy up here, you know, kind of thing. Anyway, uh, we put in all together a dozen modifications, installed them on six aircraft, embarked five, kept one back for prototyping and training in 210 hours. Unheard of. I ended up giving speeches around auto. How do you make that happen? Well, when you're focused and all this, right? You know, make it happen. Anyway, uh, it was a real. <laughs> If, I don't know if you guys ever saw, there's a video of the Admiral standing there as the ships are sailing out and there's a Sea King flying by. That's a test point. We were doing the certification flight testing as the ship sailed across the ocean. When they sailed, we had two problems. So one is 
<clears throat> because this clear is hanging on the nose of a helicopter that's bouncing around. And when you go to high res mode, you saw nothing but blur. So basically we found some vibration isolators in the UK, prototyped them on the, on the aircraft in, in Shearwater and had the mod kits ready when they got to Gibraltar. So they could fix that problem. The other problem we had is the aircraft compass dutifully pointed always to this because it's a big bloody magnet, right? And luckily we had uh, defense scientists and DREP, defense researchers down in the Pacific at the day. And they had a, a, a magnetic model for the helicopter. So we, we, we brought this scientist down and he developed a compensation system, right? So when they got to Gibraltar, they had the mod for the, for the, for the FLIR. They had the compensation kiss, uh, system and you need to do a compass swing. Right to calibrate the compass, and you can't do it on a steel ship. So Gibraltar was our last chance. Uh, the other thing we had is they had chiller chiller vests, okay, with a bucket of ice, you know, and you had to get used to flying with that. Chem gear, they're anticipating chemical warfare. We threw in a, <clears throat> a 50 cal machine gun just for the heck of it, right? <laughs> well, you do need to calibrate the stops on it because it's bad form to shoot your own rotor blades down, right? And, and the cone of the rotor varies with how much <laughs> loading you put on it. So, but so anyway, it, it, it was a, a real example of being pragmatic. I mean, you can see that from the other ones when you're limited in terms of analytical capability and stuff like that. And uh, when they sailed out of Gibraltar, they were ready to go. And because we had that FLIR, Canada, our, our two, well, there are three ships actually, they did 70% of the dawn to dusk intercepts because the United States Navy didn't have a good flare on the aircraft on their aircraft. But it was uh it was fun. And this is as my career is evolving, right? You know, I've gone from actually having fun to directing people who are managing people who are having fun. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> Shortly after that, I was uh, parachuted into the quality engineering test establishment as the uh, superintendent. And for me, that was a, I, I'd been a customer of Quiti for a long time because when you're clearing, say, a, a weapon to put on a, on, a, on a pylon, you have to do shaker tests with the, on, on, the, on the item to make sure that it just doesn't rattle and fall apart, you know, with the vibration in, in carriage. So I actually knew about that, but it was it was interesting because Quiti supports the Army, Navy, Air Force, and the and the the Wiggly Amp guys, you know, and they basically have labs that cover all the all the disciplines. You know what I mean? And uh, when I was there, we had to restructure a bunch of things, and and basically we restructured around two principal lines of business, and then there were supporting three supporting ones. The first one we called forensic engineering, and what that means is anytime we had a crash or something didn't work right, and it could have been a ship, it could be a tank, it could be a, a, a you know small arm, it could be a radio, it could be anything, an airplane. Quiti is kind of the lab of last resort to find out what.
Sorry for the interruption, everyone. We seem to have lost Carleton University's feed there. We're back. Welcome back. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate your patience. The other can last hear us uh, there. Oh, yeah, good. we can now. Thanks. <laughs> Maybe we're just going to share a screen again. We good? And you know that. I'm glad you know what you're doing. There you go. Good Two idea. years of teaching a pandemic. Yes. Yeah. Never underestimate the value of professional Thanks. health. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Al. We can hear you. Um, oh, carry good. carry on. <laughs> you sound like God talking through the ceiling here. I don't know. Please. <laughs> uh, I got pulled out of the laboratory. Uh, basically in this February of 1998 to take over the Y2K program for the Department of National Defense. Uh, the program was initiated in 1995, and basically what was needed to be done was to make assessments of the potential problems we could have with mainly digital systems with the rollover, you know, from 1999 to 2000. Uh, and, and the first step in doing that is to actually inventory what systems had a problem, right? You know, well, it turned out after three years, DND had created a lot of policies, but there was still not a lot of belief that there were problems. You know, there was like vax denial, but this was Y2K denial, right? So they brought me in and uh, I kind of viewed it totally different. I, like the, the, the computer guys, well, our job is just to fix everything. I think, well, what could go wrong there, you know? Like, uh, I didn't see that as a, as a productive way. And also when I first, when I met the minister of the day, my remit to the minister was to show him there was no degradation in capability, okay? Hmm. What had happened around that time frame? Uh, the, the, op, the planning people basically had invented a dozen capability scenarios. So they went to what's called capability-based planning. Uh, as you can imagine, when you do something like uh, conduct war in Europe or something, there's a lot of systems talking to each other, a lot of weapons and, you know, there's bad guys trying to take your systems out and whatnot. So if you were gonna feel the new capability, it had to make sense in terms of these generic high-level operational scenarios, okay? I looked at that and said, you know what? I remember points in the sky. So these were points in the sky for DND's capability. How cool is that, right? And if I'm going to show, to demonstrate the minister, no degradation in capability, then what I instituted was a program where we modeled each one of these 12 scenarios, modeling the, the way the systems interface with each other, but more importantly, the, the, they have uh, external interfaces, see, because that was overlooked, and dependencies, a lot of them, for example, require electrical power, stuff like this. The, uh, one of the scenarios uh, from a capability-based planning point of view was uh, search and rescue. <laughs> and the movie uh, Titanic had just come out, remember Cap DiCaprio dying and all this stuff, right? You know, and, uh, I'm briefing the minister because we needed $10 million to actually do the modeling, right? No other country even thought of that at the time, it's in early 98. And, uh, you know, and, and you've got a minister who's is well plugged in, but he's just, he's not a technical guy. So how do you, how do you get across to him? I said, well, I, pe I picked the search and rescue. And I said, well, we depend on it's cost pass and cost pass are Russian satellites. We're not gonna go up and flap and fix them. And the scenario was a 747 crashing in the Atlantic, in the Arctic, and the Titanic going on in the Atlantic, right? From a systems point of view, that represented the worst case, you know? And what we needed was a time domain simulation. And it looks, looks a little puzzled because you don't know what a time domain said. Well, if we're late, DiCaprio dies. <laughs> he got it. So it's really important to pick some, you know, it's about communication. I mean, and if we're late on the other one, the war is over. I mean, you know, it, you, you literally, we needed time domain simulations to make sure that the systems actually fit together. The net result of this was that we had 1,407 mission critical systems. We had an operational posture for the rollover. 
And sometimes the posture wasn't the current way of doing business because some things weren't fixable, right? So you have to have an acceptable operational posture and a workaround. And these postures were signed off by a kernel level engineer and operator, bang, bang, bang. And these were all done by the 31st or 30th of September. I guess we know 31st, right? Uh, I should know dates, right? <laughs> done by the 30th of September. And uh, we're the only country on the planet that actually had all our mission critical systems work. Now, in 1999, the US, the UK, I actually co-chaired an international committee with the US, UK, gave speeches in the Warsaw Pact, you know, from, from Stockholm, uh, Seoul, Korea, stuff like that. Uh, mainly because I was, I was de describing to them a process of windowing to protect the failure of mainly nuclear power stations, because we depend on electricity too, right? And the idea was that, uh, a lot of these nuclear power stations, well, there, remember there was a New York blackout, right? A power station requires electrical power to run. It needs to be on the grid and the grid needs to be up, right? Okay. So what would happen is uh, what happened in the, in the blackout is the grid went down and a bunch of the stations went down at the same time. It took several days to get it back up again, right? The ice storm was, was another, uh, another example. Problem with nuclear power stations is just think, uh, you know, Fukushima, <laughs> you know, places like this. You got a real problem there if they lose power. And they have very complex, uh, you know, control systems because you have, you know, generation, distribution, or transmission and distribution. So it's a generating area that was worried about. And it was a high risk, and you could not actually validate everything. I had a, a, a P, uh, public affairs guy whose job it was, was to read all these newspapers and magazines and whatever he could find and distill out everything that had to do with Y2K. I don't have time to do all that. I've got a program to run, right? And I remember this one day I'm going through this and there was a, and he, it was written up, it was some guy in Saskatchewan. And I got I imagine this guy is like a farmer, a dirt farmer, but he also runs a little power plant, right? You know, and he's probably suntanned and everything, you know. <laughs> and it, and I could just imagine this young computer geek, you know, rolls the calendar forward on his systems and let's see, it works. He's about to roll it back. He said, stop. What? This isn't, this isn't an exercise. We made it. Get out of here. I saw, like, a lot of people look at it, never I think, thought about it. I looked and I said, he's dead right. The computer doesn't know what the actual date really is. So I gave a, I, I was asked to brief the Russian delegation in Brussels, remember, we, we, and, and there was a US, UK, the Dutch, and, and moi, and there's the, you know, Russian, we used to talk to them back then. And we wanted to make sure they did their end, because if not, there could be an accidental nuclear war, which probably not help anybody, right? And I asked to go last, right? <laughs> and the US, UK, and Dutch were all about the great work they're doing solving their systems, you know? And I watched the eye glaze, you know, like the eye roll of the Russians, right? My message was totally different. I talked about the ice storm, okay, and how that created our sensitivity to electrical failure. And the thing is that if you have an isolated station go offline, a good operator get it up in a matter of minutes, still a minor ripple. But what do you do when you have a synchronized failure across a whole bloody time zone? Big problem. So basically what I briefed the Russians based on this guy in Saskatchewan, and later it got called windwing. It wasn't known, that wasn't what we're, we didn't know that word back then. I recommended to him that his vulnerability is synchronized failure. Who cares about Canada systems? Yeah, we got it now, but you should worry about this, right? And your problem is synchronized failure. And I recommended that they do a risk management or risk mitigation approach of basically rebooting each one of their generating stations to a different date in the past. So it's what's called a forward and backward horizon. So you go far enough back. So by the time you get to the other side, you can pop back and reboot. Don't have to fix anything. Yeah, it's cool. Hey, well, it's kind of funny about it. I mean, the Russians got it. And, and in, in, in NATO, a colonel, I mean, you don't even rate an ashtray. I mean, it's generals and you know senior bureaucrats and stuff. And so they had a little reception after, and I'm hanging around with the other military guys, you know, beer or champagne. 
The Russian ambassador left that group and walked over to talk to me. He knew my name. He knew my serial number. I mean, these guys do their homework, right? He shook my hand, called me Al. Oh, okay, sir. <laughs> you know, do you know where I was? He's asking me uh, during the ice storm. I said, no, I did, sir. He was in Montreal. And he remembers driving from Montreal to Ottawa, and he saw one light, one little light bulb in the whole trip. He never forgot that. And he looked at me, said, said, Al, your presentation is the only one that made any sense. Thank you. We'll do that. I said, well, you're welcome. And they did. So that's how come I ended up giving, like, briefing the Warsaw Pact, briefing Asia, mainly because they're just connecting the dots, you know, kind of thing. But the big news here as well was taking the idea of, uh, of points in the sky, applying it organizationally. The other thing was, uh, there's a thing called the fifth discipline was just coming in, which was actually the more modeling being used in, in the business environment. So that was a kind of a synergy between the, you know, scenario-based planning, the, the, the fifth discipline and points in the sky and me, you know, poof, you know, they anyway, we pull it up. Now, as students, when you're doing an exam, right, you, I imagine you'd kind of check your work if you've got time. So I'm briefing like the deputy minister of the CDS and, and it's now first week in October. And I'm up there, you know, they have this thing called post-dem. Well, Al, <laughs> what should we do now? And I said, well, I think we need to check our work, right? Just like an exam. And we had a bunch of defense scientists who were just chomping at the bit to help. And I said, we've got all these postures, all these systems. We need to turn them loose and make sure that those postures are valid. Wow. Great idea. Then the next week, what else should we do? Because that's unfolding. I said, well, we had 10,000 non-mission critical systems. You have fiduciary responsibility to do something about those. So basically, the last three months, okay, the, the mission critical stuff was done. It all worked. The last three months was uh, basically checking our work and, and looking after non-mission critical uh, systems. Yeah. So you never know where you're gonna end up, right? You know, Y2K, I, I'm an airplane guy, you yeah, know, right? Now, I also got involved, uh, <laughs> I worked briefly on a, I won't mention a company, but you Google. <laughs> uh, we were bidding the NH-90 for the maritime helicopter project. By the way, this slide comes from a presentation I gave at, at, a, at a conference in actually RFC at the time. I thought this was interesting. What you see here, this is a six page specification for a heavier than air flying machine dated 10th of February, 1908. The first one, six pages, you know? And I include signature blocks down the bottom. This is what we had to do for the pre-qualification, not even the competition. This is to get shortlisted. Each response, like we had to create our, our responses in paper was 50,000 pages, and we have to have seven copies and binders. We had to rent a cube van to deliver them. If you stacked them up, it would be a seven-story building, right? You know? And uh, you know. In addition to that, we had all kinds of media, you know, like DVDs, CDs, and all this stuff, right? The project office hired 100 consultants just to read all this stuff, right? Now, this isn't to get the contract. This is just to get through the gate to actually get the RFP. <laughs> so there's a difference between complicated and complex. Complicated is when you have a bunch of disparate things and there isn't a path to optimization. Right? I got a bunch of apps on my phone. They don't talk to each other. They all have different you know, websites, all different passwords. That's complicated. In other words, there is no optimization thing, right? Complex is when you have a systems view of things, right? So uh, in systems engineering, uh, you know, and, and as you see the evolution, like the F 35s as opposed to that, you know, 1906 airplane, you know. The, the pilot's actually, it's like, it's, it's, he's like Iron Man. He's got a helmet just like Iron Man, and that's his interface. It, the helmet costs a million bucks, tracks his eyeballs, and knows his voice, right? And he's just sitting back in his, you know, laid back at 30 degrees going, you know, 0.95 or whatever. He can even fly hands off information, whatever. And if, and, it's, and if he looks over there and sees something, 
it'll say, uh, oh, yeah, whether well, it's a target or not. And he can say shoot or or don't, right? You know, designate, de-designate, shoot, whatever. You know, you don't, it's bad form to shoot your wingman, stuff like this, right? But it's all that integrated, right? See, and there as there is optimization. Remember, I mentioned earlier doing tracking tasks, you know, like wind up turns to to assess controllability. There was a report, Boeing. I probably shouldn't talk about that. <laughs> there was a report that came out about how the how the F thirty five couldn't out turn an F sixteen, but that wasn't the purpose of the test. The purpose of the test was to find out what coefficients to set in the in the uh, flight control computers. It's a software defined airplane, right? Uh, and in case you're wondering, like how important fifth uh, uh, or what they call it, fifth generation or fifth uh, whatever stealth. Okay, I remember I was following this because you know we were at the time our company was trying to get some business with with uh, with uh, Lockheed and Boeing actually. The the first time they they put. Uh, a couple F-35s at uh, Nellis. That's uh, that's the Air Force equivalent of Top Gun, okay. And there also was an exercise in um, in uh, Alaska, and and basically the F-35 is up against the F-15s. Okay, there's F-22s as well, and you know, and the F-18 Super Hornets and whatnot. The kill ratio was thirty to nothing. So in other words, the F-35 killed thirty. Nobody touched an F-35 because you can't shoot what you can't see. And an F-35 is an upgraded F-22 coming at you, but not going away. See, the reason the F-22 is so expensive is it maintains its signature all the way around. Very difficult when you look at the tailpipe and stuff, right? So it's it's basically an upgraded F-22 coming at you. And, it's, and it doesn't even, you, you know, BVR, beyond visual range. So that's why... Uh, you know, if you want to bring the boys home after after their flight, that's a, the aircraft. That, that's why the Air Force needed it. I mean, let's face it, you know. But anyway, this was uh, it's just a, a diversion in terms of, of complexity. Complexity now also includes the external environment. I mean, green aviation, things like this, you know. So you can't just think in terms of the airplane and the man-machine interface. That's about as far as we got. You actually have to look at the ecosystem. Now, what made things complicated is the ecosystem includes the business environment, right? How much does it cost? The political environment, you know, and a bunch of things other than things related to the vehicle performing. That's why you end up with fifty thousand pages of, of stuff because of things like ITBs and stuff. All good, all good initiatives, but they render it very difficult to make an optimization because it's not an integrated system, it's just complicated. What do I got next here? The adventure continues. <laughs> okay. So this is after I'd, uh, later on after I left the, the, you know, the military. By the way, during the 90s, uh, I went from presenting papers to now chairing sessions and conferences. I was also, you know, by the way, the CASI journal is going to be coming back hopefully this year. We had a bit of a hiatus during the during the uh, pandemic. Uh, back in the '90s, they had selected people review the papers, and there was a you know an award for the best paper. So I was one of the reviewers. Did that for several years. Uh, I spent uh, 13. The, the the company you see here. This was the aerospace and defense company I worked for for 13 years. Uh, that technician is actually working on space wire heart. I think it's something in about space, right? You know, and I couldn't believe it. I get a clean room and all this stuff, but it is, they would basically design and build, uh, you know, the, the wire harnesses for, um, you know, satellites. You know, Radar sat was one of them, for example. They showed me this cube, it was about 18 inches square, 40,000 connections. 40,000 in that box, you have to use wire that doesn't outgas because you're in a hard vacuum and the outgas would basically blind the sensors. Who to know? You know, so we had we had technicians like that person you see there, NASA qualified to do the, the attachments, the, you know, to, to 
bond these things and use that. It was amazing. And if you, we had to build, I think, six or seven to fly one because there's all the different ground tests, you know, that were done, shaker tests and vacuum. Well, you know all about that, right? <laughs> we have an expert over there. So anyway, during this time, uh, I, basically, I was on the CASI council. So I've been a counselor geez, since, you know, around 2005 or so, you know. I was also on the AIC Space Committee and uh, and, the, and, and the AIC Technology Innovation Committee. And it's because of that Technology Innovation Committee that, that when I left IMP, I ended up working here at Carleton for a while, which was which was a lot of fun. And then the pandemic came along and put an end to things. The uh, thing that got me on the Space Committee, I stuck up my hand and said, we need a Canadian launch capability. This is back you know, when Emerson was a uh, minister. And, you know, there's, there's some high rollers there. I'm just some guy that represents a company that builds wire harnesses. <laughs> they like having me around because, hey, you know, I don't know. <laughs> <Right? laughs> I said, you know, for a country, I mean, this really is something that should happen. And you notice now, like there was an announcement just last week that the government's finally supporting it and, you know, got the the maritime launch facility or whatever they call themselves, you know, finally, you know. Well, of course, that's what the avenue of, of uh, you know, small sats, that's what made it really possible. Back then, everybody was thinking of, you know, launching, you know, things the size of a school bus, you know, of the geosynchronous orbit or for refrigerators in low Earth orbit, see? So there's a big difference when you have little CubeSats and you pull together half a dozen of them and send it off. So. And then, uh, Finally, President Akazi, and this is my first presentation in such a role. So for me, it's been a lifelong adventure. This is a list of, you know, the, from the website. The bottom line is you get out of it what you put into it, right? And for me, the Air Force, yeah, I party with my Air Force buddies still, you know, those are still alive, right? But I also enjoy the company of you guys going to the conferences and stuff. So that's the other, the other community for me. I like this. I don't know if you remember red, green, you know, we're all in this together kind of thing. And, uh, you know, I'm open to questions. I love this slide. Junior with the symbols. Look at Mrs. Penguin in the back. Of the, Come on, Junior, don't wake the bear, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> so, so anyway, that's all I got. And I, I'm quite happy to, to answer questions or tell more stories. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Al. So um, mm -hmm. I know the hour's uh, advancing a little bit, but uh, if, if there's any questions uh, from the in-person audience, and uh, I will prompt the uh, the chat. See, uh, Do you want me to play a quick video? Sure. Uh, <laughs> I, I need professional help to do okay. that. Uh, this is a wake-up video, and it was... Uh, I was at a, a big trade show in Washington in 1994. And this uh, this was the F-18 advertising. They just built their thousand sketch and all this stuff. And basically, this is a video about all the factors in an F-18, you know, manufactured, designed, or flying, done to life as a highway. And so when I was well, in headquarters getting beaten into submission by bureaucrats, I would go home and play this to remember what my roots were. Right? <laughs> Um, we may need to turn the music down on that because it will actually get blocked by YouTube if we play copyrighted music. But at least we'll be able to see the video. Yeah, we can edit the music out afterwards. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we can answer questions and just let this play and uh, Al can have a, be the voiceover of the video <laughs> while we take questions. But, yeah, I if there are too, questions. Though, but yeah, let's do that. Oh, okay. great. Perfect. <laughs> are there any- I'll try not to look at it because it is just kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, it, it's going to be out in a few weeks. They're, they've got a venue and all that. Yeah, they're just, I meant watching all the emails, those different session sections are finalizing. I haven't have missed the deadline for all papers. Oh, no, Super. you're good. Awesome. And you certainly haven't missed the deadline for submitting senior awards. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
question in the back there? Um, you mentioned the wrinkles in the, uh, I think it was the F5 or the F1. No, it's a 104 F fuselage, yeah. Was that done in manufacture, just like after the first flight of the that you did? Or how was that? The, uh, it, it's interesting. Uh, structures get stronger when they do a 45 degree wrinkle. It's really funny. A pilots don't ever want to hear that, right, kind of thing. And uh, in fact, there was uh, a philosophy for, you know, when you had a production aircraft to go out and nail the max G limit so that you would actually, you know, this equivalent of stop drilling if there are any cracks, you know, kind of thing. Uh, it's a demonstration too, but actually that helped. Um, yeah, they, they, it's, it's like taking a, 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 you know, a pop can and twisting it. That's where it comes from, okay? Because you got the T tail and wing. And you have uh, a steady state roll rate of was 270 degrees per second. Uh, you know, it varies with Mach and Q and stuff right there and, and abrupt input to it, you know. So you do get a lot of torque. And if you have um, stores and there is a critical configuration, you could get the side slip augmenting the torque, see. So there's a lot more complexity to those wind up turns than, than I, I talked about because you need to, to get that going in addition to the pylon loads. But yeah, but it's fun to go there. If you look at it, you'll see the, you know, this way kind of thing, We're just in front of the, uh, it's right behind the rear, there's five wing attachment fittings and right behind the rear attachment fitting, that panel was where the torque was was uh, handled. Yeah. But we had little guys with rulers, you know, measuring it and stuff. Like, what are you gonna do? You see? And the other thing, there was another lesson in this. Uh, when the 104 was bought, uh, our aircraft are G models. So they were able to carry a 2000 pound store on, on the center line. The original 104 was a point interceptor and it had a thing, we call it catamaran. It had, like, had two AIM-9 rails. So it was designed to hustle out at Mach 2 and then take a shot at somebody and kind of coast back on fumes, you know. Well, we needed to deliver, you know, large ordnance. So it was a 2000 pound shape. We also had a photo recce pod that, that was put on it. So there was extra, reinforcement in the, in the structure, particularly on the dual, because the dual had a larger canopy. So you generated more side slip in these maneuvers and side slip gives the torque and also, uh, you know, gives side bending loads on the pylons. That's why I was in the back because the dual was the most critical airplane in that configuration. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <By me. laughs> Sorry, you didn't have much space going on here, but. <laughs> Congratulate. I'd like to congratulate you all for an excellent presentation. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And uh, and I, I didn't know that you started as a pilot. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I saw the light. <laughs> and I just like to ask you one question. Sure. Uh, when you compare, you know, within aerospace engineering to disciplines, main disciplines, you know, like aeronautical and space engineering. Yeah, both involve, of course, a lot of multidisciplinary efforts. Big time, yeah. Big time, and also testing. Mm -hmm. You can say that, uh, from my perspective, when I watch your presentation, I think about our navigation. It is more difficult than space. I moved. I moved essentially from structural engineering yeah, to yeah. space engineering. Yeah, but I think that space is maybe a little bit easier. Because, because, you know, in, uh, here you have the CFD and you have so many aspects yeah. of flight mechanics and some other things associated with electronics and so on. I don't know. What... You, you can say a little bit. Yeah. You compare this to yeah. two big, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, disciplines or domains. And in fact, they... they they, they are part of our institute at the same time. Oh, they are, yeah. The, uh, <laughs> I guess if you look at the, the commonalities, you know, structural loads, you know, vibration, things like this, um, thrust, you know, in, in, in space, the big complexity in space is, is solar radiation and heating, hard vacuum, you know, the wires and things like this they had to use, cold, I mean, you have real thermal extremes, so we had to design harnesses that didn't expand or contract too much and stuff like this. You don't really have that kind of problem on, on, on uh, aeronautics, okay? You do have a, 
I mean, you're, you're deriving lift, you know, from a fluid called air, right? You know, kind of thing. So that's where a lot of that complexity happens. Uh, you know, submarines, I guess, doing the same thing, but they, their, their buoyant forces are a lot bigger than, <laughs> than aircraft's buoyant force, right? And in space, uh, you know, also because, you see, our, our problem with controllability, I mean, and again, because we're flying into fluid and we have control service, we can do a lot of, you know, high, you know, maneuvering and whatnot, whereas in space, you're very limited. And you and basically most of the time you're in a in a some kind of zero g orbit, right? Now where things get really tough, okay, let's go to Mars. So now you you've got a, a helicopter, you got a different atmosphere, you know, kind of thing. So you have those problems. You have uh, in in Mars, there's no uh, Van Allen radiation belt, so that you've got raw radiation coming through the atmosphere, which is kind of a real problem for humans. In the in the 70s, I was down at uh, at uh, uh, Tullahoma, Tennessee, and there's an Arnold Engineering Development Center, and I did a. It was kind of interesting going there. I mean, they had a this one building I was in. There was a sea of refrigeration compressors, and that was the, that basically allowed them to directly simulate altitude and temperature for a F-100 engine, 35,000 pound class engine. So pretty amazing and all these things pumping away. The other thing they had, they were looking at, at, uh, at, the, at the heating of materials entering Jupiter, the atmosphere in Jupiter, highly dense stuff like that. So they had these plasma jets and stuff. That was, uh, yeah, uh, I guess the other thing also like, bird strikes right i mean they actually had guns to fire little two pound thawed out chickens or whatever you know or buckets of little starlings and stuff you know like because it really matter like how many of these can the can the can the engine eat before something goes wrong see so that's a, I, I i didn't mention birds during my whole thing by the way we had a pelican strike on, on one of the f5s yeah, that was pretty funny well it wasn't funny i mean you know kind of thing it's Luckily, it was summer, and so we parked it outside because just stank of burnt fish, right? You know, kind of thing. But uh, but you don't have kind of that problem. But I see the, I tend to see a lot of similarities, but you really have to be aware of the differences. And and controllability is a whole different thing, um, you know. And and also the the you know you have a different constraint in terms of the orbital stability of, of different configurations of things. You know what I mean? Big time vibration testing, you'd know that, you know, big time thermal and big time hard vacuums and stuff and radiation, you know. So it, it's quite a, it, but to see the other thing is we have a whole remote sensing group. So it's not just the vehicles, you know, it's the, it's the use of those platforms to actually monitor the environment and stuff like this, which is a whole different thing, right? We have sensors on, on aircraft as well, but you know, they do some replication of that. It's it's quite a, yeah, it's, it's I had a chat with a guy from the Donald Detweiler and oh, space is completely different. Well, I see similarities and it, like anything, you gotta know what the differences are, you know? And the same with aircraft, you know, if you're a helicopter, if you're operating a helicopter, that's a lot different than, you know, an F-35 or something, you know? So yeah, it's, it's uh, I've just seen over the years that the, the number of different technologies involved, you know, the you know man machine interface. Now it's man integrated into the machine. You know the optimization. I mean, you look at the subtlety of the F thirty five aerodynamics. It doesn't have a lex. It's the chime built in. You know things like that. You know and short wings and so. Uh, and you look at uh, say for example on in space. You know the. Uh, you know, going to less uh, exotic fuels, you know, and you've got uh, rockets that are now 3D printed, you know, reusable rockets, big ones, <laughs> you know. I don't, I don't know, it's, uh, you know, the ISS has been quite a thing as well, you know, and, and in fact, a report just came out on, it's, you know, they sent a report every year of what's been done and it just came out, actually saw it yes, earlier today, you know. So yeah, it's 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 getting more interesting, and your tools are more powerful. 
They're not 18K word computers. Okay, they were 24 bit words, but man, you know, and it had lights, eh? and these weren't LEDs. And the operator could actually watch the lights and knew what it was doing. That's how slow it was, you know. You know, and you look at what goes on now and what's integrated into that helmet. I remember in the 70s, the first time they were starting to do voice integration, you know, on an aircraft. And it started out, and the Patuxent River was big on that there at the time. And the pilot would strap in and, and you know, they fire up the jet and he'd read something, you know, because it has to train to his voice. So he'd read this Gettysburg Address or whatever the heck it was, you know, and then he'd go out and away he'd go, right? Well, what they found was that as he's pulling G, his voice changes, you know, so I had trouble, you know, recognizing that. When somebody's on his tail, they're going to shoot him. His voice changes again. So that, so it was really funny uh, looking looking at uh, at that. The uh, on the F eighteen, they have a, a a voice, you know, that's uh, like telling someone to pull up or whatever, right? You know, and you can imagine the din, like when you're in in a jet. There's a lot of noise going on. Dee, 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 dee. That's the guy targeting you, you know, kind of thing and stuff like this, and. And how do you get the guy's attention? So there's a lot of psychology and stuff. And and I actually met the woman who who's in McDonnell Douglas in St. Louis, whose voice was used for the voice thing, because he wanted a, a voice that would something like mother, you know, kind of a motherly voice, calm, cuts through because this guy is about to die. You know, he, okay, pull up, pull up, you know, kind of thing, that kind of stuff. On the 104, we had uh, what's called shaker and kicker. Um, the leading edge on the 104 was actually sharpened, okay, to basically anchor the vortex. Uh, but once you got to 10 degrees uh, angle of attack, varied a bit with Mach number, the tip vortex would peel off, okay? And the, the vortex would hit the V stab, right? The horizontal tail, poof, and you'd pitch up, right? And there were two modes of, uh, of spin. There's one where it's just going all over the place, right? You know, kind of thing. And there was one that was a flat spin, basically. The wild spin, uh, yeah, I mean, people would, would like put gear down or, you know, flaps. You got to kind of, there's, there's NACA one, two, and three standard protocols to try and to get yourself out of trouble like that right you know uh the 104 they've never recovered on a on a flat spin it's a stable mode and you just don't have enough degrees of freedom you know an f14 for example the the the, the engines are far enough apart a little bit of asymmetric thrust and you just push your way out of it piece of cake right what you watch the f35 to for a guy of my generation just eye watering well let's just stop and just do this, you know, I mean, what, <laughs> you know, kind of thing, but that's the, you know, cause and effect, that's the, the strong aerodynamic design, plus, uh, you know, basically the control systems and stuff, you know, so, so you guys are going to have a lot of fun, I mean, geez, you know, I'm jealous, no, I'm not. <laughs> so there's a question from, uh, from Jeff Bird, Jeff, can you hear me, do you want to ask your question on the audio? Okay, maybe not. Um, so his uh, Jeff's question is, uh, where does he see Cassie? Sorry, where do you Al, see Cassie making contributions uh, to aero and, and space? Well, the contributions come from the members, you know, and basically Cassie provides the glue to actually create a community. I mean, we're you know, you look at the at like the Astro Conference, the papers that were presented. I mean, it was impressive. You know, the Aero Conference is coming up. That's where there's a sharing of information. I think the, the conferences and the branches are really big, right? You know, uh, and it, and it's about the well, it's about community, but it's more than that. It's it's uh, I mean, just having a conversation with somebody, telling a war story or something. Oh, I never thought of that. You know, I mean. This Alpha Q thing, that just came up in a conversation. Oh, I need to dig around a little bit. Well, it does scale that way, you know, you know kind of thing. And I, I sold it to the instructor guy. <laughs> he bought it. <laughs> the, uh, just to digress a bit, the, uh, 
I mentioned the explosive bolts in the pylon of a, of a 104, okay? You are not allowed to, you cannot eject with a store on the, on the 104 because the center of gravity of the store is so far forward, it'll just spin around and take the wing out. Well, the little bit of wing that you have, right? But the question was, when you're flying in the biplane mode, i.e. empty twin store carrier, can you punch them off? Oh, great. So back to basic physics, you know, I needed the impulse from the explosive bolt. So we rigged up a thing out at the range where we had a bolt inverted, you know, with the cartridge in it and a, and a representative mass and it fired it up and, you know, it's all 400 frames per second and it came down. And from that, I could determine what the impulse was. And uh, basically I did the numbers and even at zero airspeed, if you fired the thing, I'm just going to take out the leading edge flap. And of course, if you got any airspeed at all, gets worse, right? You know, so basically because of that and, and that kind of test, we determined that for safety reasons, you had to remove the cartridge from the explosive bolt because it now represented a hazard. It was not usable and a stray bolt would cut it off. Oh yeah, you all kinds of things come on. Great. Well, um, oh, one, one. Okay. Great. Um, Vanessa. By the, by the way, if I can't hear, I have a hearing disability, so I'm hanging around Jet. So <laughs> sorry. You're talking about uh, running your flight uh, your flight points for the test. You have to do these like very quick the impulse maneuvers. Yeah. I mentioned the reason for doing like the quick stop on the pedal, the quick motion was to yeah, increase a very high impulse force into the system. That well, kind of what you're trying to do, you, I mean, there's varying degrees of entry in a maneuver. Uh -huh. I think that's what you're referring to, right? Your abrupt rolling pull ups yes. and stuff. The worst case is. As fast as you can do yeah, it. Okay. And, so, and test pilots are trained to do that. So you're 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 testing the extreme of that maneuver. Okay. So I guess in that case where you're asking the test pilot to do this in front maneuver, you're saying it's you know they have to go to the right because they're you know well, it's easier. Well you have the you throttle have, on your left hand too. Do you need to like are the test pilots like is there a rating system to make sure they can achieve some of that minimum speed? Well, okay, well, if you go to Edwards. Or, or Fiduxen River in, in, in the US, and there's, there's ones in Europe. They get trained to do this, okay? And there's instrumentation. But just think about it. It's harder to do this way than this way. No, I guess I was more curious about, I imagine it takes some amount of time to hit that rate. Oh yeah, but it's like, it's, it's a fraction. It's a fraction of a second, okay. that fast. Remember my head? And, I, and he's counting in now. <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> are, there, are there any, would there be any autopilot system that would be able to recreate? Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. On the F-18, now we did not buy the, when we bought the 104, there was a conscious decision to remove all the instrumentation wiring so that it could be fully operational and capable. When we bought the F-18, I was in at the meeting and I looked around the table, there was an ex senior test pilot, whatever. We made the decision to leave the instrumentation in because some of it only goes in while the airplane's being built, right? One of the items they have on the F-18 is called a FQ, Flutter Exciter Control Unit. So on the F-5, the guy is hands off, trim, stick wrap, right? Stick wrap, right? Well, it's not going to do anything on a 104. We never never bothered, right? But on the F-18, the, the flight controls are digital, right? So you have a, a needle valve operating a hydraulic like piano hinge, right? Updated 50 times a second. Yeah. So, you know, it's all, and you've got four computers all put in, in different locations. So no scrape, no one bullet can take them all out. You have degraded modes on and on and on. So anyway, what you do is you use the FQ to do a sweep and a dwell. You're sitting there. You trim the airplane hands off at the test point, hit the button, set the parameters up. You know, the guy, you know, watching everything. Yeah. I think that like vibration is one of the difference in how you excite the motion. <laughs> um, so I guess it's one last I remember giving a speech once and, and I, you know, you know, he's me doing this and doing this, but you try and do, Anti-symmetric bending and torsion, you know, it's like a little dance. Right? <laughs> I guess it's really, I guess, passing the torque. Passing interested in, I guess, advanced air mobility in Canada. 
absolutely yeah yeah yeah, yeah i didn't there, there's so many fields now yeah. yeah yeah because it also deals with the application those are you know uavs i think we have an expert here <laughs> you know kind of thing and electric aviation a lot of the air mobility stuff you know is looking at electric aviation nrc has a, a one they're doing experiments with you know oh cool and, and you know the different fuels uh, you know trying to get green hydrogen you know kind of thing instead of gray or blue or whatever yeah big problem with hydrogen i mean the reason we like jp8 or whatever it is now is just straight you know you know so many btu per pound you know because it's ultimately heat you know and the amount of thrust you get to, is a limited by the by your turbine inlet temperature because it's bad form if you melt the turbine and the amount of thrust you get is the heat going out compared with the heat of the air coming in i mean really you know if anything so bad form thanks by the way the, the 104 uh had a thing called t2 reset t2 is is the compressor inlet temperature okay and uh the the 104 is limits you're limited to 750 knots equivalent that's an engine pressure limit it blows up right so 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 at lower altitude 750 equivalent right then you're limited to uh, uh 121 121 degrees centigrade do we hit the Mach limit first? See, Mach two was a Mach two limit was two things. The one is the inlet cone at Mach two. The the shock was coincident with the with the uh, inlet. Okay, and if you ever slipped through Mach two, what happened? You know, you could actually hear it in the in the in the cockpit. That you would get a strong shock forming in the inlet between the oblique shock and the lip and it sounded like someone throwing gravel down the intake that's what it sounded like in the cockpit and if it, if it ever sounded like rocks the next sound you hear would be the engine blowing out because of, of the of the turbulence right so you have 750 knots equivalent with an engine pressure limit Mach 2 at the other end that limit is based on two things one is the engine intake the other is rule coupling uh, CN beta yawing moment through the side slip had to be greater than 0 0.001. Otherwise, in a full deflection 1G roll, the aircraft would roll a couple and break up basically. And in between is a CIT limit. And you actually had a CIT gauge, 121 degrees centigrade. That was so the quickest way to get to altitude. Okay. And there used to be a demo back, they'd have a voodoo. And a 104, the voodoo, pfft, great amount of noise and whatever. The 104 just go like this, go to Mach 0.95, stand on his tail and beat the guy to 35,000 feet, right? You know, but uh, yeah, it was a cool airplane. I mean, that's uh, to me, it's a, it's a classic. There's subtlety in the materials, like the titanium barrel and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, and, and the design of it, uh, Kelly Johnson, it was done on a napkin over lunch you know and at the time they were just starting to to evaluate biconvex airfoils naco was and so this uh, the 104 actually has a modified biconvex which meant that from the hit from the flap hinge line back it's a biconvex wing but from the front you actually have camber because the bottom's flat and it curves down yeah and, and like i mentioned before the leading edge is sharpened you know, just to anchor that uh, tip vortex as long as possible. And, you know, there's a, a whole lot of subtlety. It is an amazing platform, actually. When they did the, the aircraft that's at the museum, it was used by Bud White to go up to 106,000 feet or whatever. And uh, what they did, you'll see there's the inlet, there's a cone, and there's a spike extension that allowed him to get to Mach 2.2, you know, okay. And he could get uh, 120 to 1 centigrade is, is, you know, a limit for as long as you want. He was cleared so many minutes at 123 and so many minutes at 125. Okay, so ideally he would hit, you know, 125 Mach, uh, you know, 2.2. And, and you basically pull the nose up and every degree of, of, of nose up translated so many thousand feet of zoom. 
and that uh, you come out of burner by 55,000 feet, 65,000 feet throttled idle because there's just not enough air. And you had a big angle of attack gauge because that's what you're flying, literally. Because you're down below 50 knots. I mean, the aircraft doesn't operate there, but you know, so you're just kind of coasting. The, um, they had a, a, a larger a larger battery and hydraulic accumulator. All your controls are hydraulic. So as you're going up, the problem was, you know, you got an engine rotation. It would generate a yaw. And in fact, the uh, first early attempts, uh, and Edwards always used the 104 for <laughs> space shuttle training because the same glide ratio, you know, but also for that. But they cheated. They had, they had thrusters, right? But what you had to do is anticipate the fact that there'd be a no slice. Remember, I mentioned that spin thing, you know, kind of thing. We'll try that with no air, and then if you're working your way down. So as you're coming down, the the uh, you know you put the ram air. You have a ram air rack, ram air turbine comes out here, a little propeller. It's a generator and hydraulic pump. <laughs> nice having controls, you know. And basically, when you get through about fifty five thousand feet, you try igniters and try to relight the engine. The um, glide speed normally uh, was 330 knots. And the way the, the, the approach was done, if this is the runway, you actually come this way across the runway at about 20,000 feet above ground. And it's literally like a, a dive. You do a 270 degree roll at 330 knots so that you have enough hydraulic pressure and electrics. And when you're, you're, when you physically cross the threshold, you blow the landing gear down. <laughs> you got no, uh, the, uh, you couldn't use land flaps because it required boundary layer control to hold the airflow. So all you had were takeoff flaps. You had, you're running into a problem with this, with the tire limits, 270 knots, you know, kind of thing. So, so basically, as soon as you put the gear down, I mean, you're just going to stop, <laughs> you know, the kind of thing, right? So you waited till then. And, and, and set it down, you know, and pop the chute kind of thing. Yeah, it was quite a, there's a, there's quite a lot of, quite a ride, I guess. I've never done that, obviously, but uh, I had to look into that because uh, DCIM and Civil Institute of Environmental Medicine were wondering about the effects of acceleration on eyeballs. I mean, right. <laughs> so somebody came to me, Mr. 104, like, okay, how much acceleration can we do? You know, so we actually, you know, full A, B on takeoff and the guy's looking sideways and they're tracking his life all smoothly. Things they do, right? You know, kind of thing. So I don't know what happened with that, but you know, kind of thing. But the other thing that was funny was, uh, well, on, on an F-18, you have CCIP and CCRP. Uh, CCIP is continuously computed impact point. So in other words, your radar and everything is telling you where the ground is, and there's a dot. Okay, so as you're jigging and whatever, while people are trying to shoot at you, all you have to do is is, is lay that pipper on the target and pickle, and you're and you know you'll hit like within hundred feet. CCRP is continuously computed release point, and what happens there is you you designate the target. And just try and fly some profile that hopefully will someday result in a shooting solution, right? <laughs> you know, bingo, away it goes, right? The uh, on the F five and the one hundred and four, you didn't have that, and you had uh, most releases for weapons, like a bomb, dumb bomb, that's what they're called, and they're not guided. But it was uh, plus half a G. I got called in because uh, there was uh, damage. We have a, a the F5 retarded is what it's called, but that just means it has pins that come out to slow it down, right? You know. And this one pilot was was really good at hitting the target, but he was damaging the horizontal stabilizer on the F5. So he brought me in. I'm not his favorite guy. What he was doing, I mean, if you think about it, it's almost an impossible task, right? You know, you're looking, you've got a fixed sight, you know, you're calculating, okay, I'm gonna do a 30 degree dive. I'm gonna magically hit 30 degrees, pipper on the target, so many hundred feet of altitude and, and exactly airspeed. That is hard to do, right? It takes a lot of practice. And that's why CEP, circular error probables, were up in the hundred feet, right? But he got a big bomb, who cares if he's one of the <laughs> What this guy was doing, he would get the pipper there 
And then he'd unload the aircraft and hold the pipper on the target for a split second, then pickle. So what his profile was, he was actually for that split second or few seconds flying a spiral around the target. Got him. So he was actually going below a half a G, scoring beautifully. <laughs> yeah. So. Right. Well, uh, <laughs> on behalf of uh, Cassie Ottawa Branch, uh, oh. so Jeff, uh, who's co chair, and myself, uh, yeah. we'd like to present uh, this is actually my copy, so I'll get you your own. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, this is one of my favorite books, and uh, okay, oh, you know, great. Yeah, the great. Wright Brothers, uh, Inventors, but actually, you know, original system engineers. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So well, thank, thank you. you so much. Well, it's been my treat. Yeah, really, it was a, a great presentation. You touched on so many different yeah. uh, aspects, um, you know, and we all have homework to do on acronyms, LCO, FLIRS, etc. <laughs> Lex. Yeah, Lex. So you you definitely touched on, on a lot of elements. And uh, okay. also, yeah, uh, the complexity uh, versus uh, complicated, oh, uh, time, yeah. definitely uh, important uh, distinction there. So yeah. thank you uh, very much. And thanks to everyone who yeah. came out here in person and those who are on Zoom. Yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, really enjoyed it. Ne next year, my theme may be philosophy. <laughs> Why not? Well, complexity, complicated, there's more. There's, Absolutely. There's, yeah, it's going to take a bit of work. Yeah. <laughs> Less can, Al stories, more philosophy. No, we can <laughs> build, build on to the next, uh, on to the next year. So, yeah. yeah, thanks so much. Well, it's been my pleasure. Yeah, great to see you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Al, from the, from the people online. We had almost 30 people. Uh, thanks for your time. And we look forward to you giving us some challenges to be the member contributors.